Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, for today's event on Africa and the Arms Trade Treaty. Uh, Sharon Squassoni, who directs our Proliferation Prevention Program, has run into a travel snafu in Japan, so you get me instead. I'm Jennifer Cook, director of the Africa Program, uh, but I do want to say a big thanks to her team for putting this event together. Uh, we're looking today at the, U the UN Arms Trade Treaty uh, and its potential significance for conflict and insecurity in Africa. According to the African Union, some 20% of the world's small arms and light weapons are to be found in Africa, a continent where capacities to track, regulate, and control the inflow and proliferation of small arms uh, is exceedingly weak. Uh, the vast majority of these illicit arms come from outside of Africa, where unscrupulous non-African governments and arms traffickers like the infamous uh, Victor Boot and so forth have literally made a killing. Uh, today, one only has to look at the brutality uh, and devastation in the Central African Republic, in South Sudan, uh, the predations of violent uh, extremist and militant groups like Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, AQIM uh, in, in the Sahel, um, M23 in DRC, uh, to understand uh, how, conflict, how these conflicts have been made so much more deadly by the proliferation and easy access to arms. At the heart of the Arms Trade Treaty is an effort to curb the illicit trade of arms and weaponry uh, that could be potentially be used in genocide, crimes against humanity, and uh, 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 war crimes. The Arms Trade Treaty was adopted last year in April by the UN. It was signed by the United States uh, last, last September. There's still a long ways to go on the treaty. Uh, for the U.S. to become a party, it has to pass a two-thirds uh, vote within the Senate to ratify it. Uh, and for the treaty to enter force, it has to be uh, receive uh, 50 ratifications globally. And there are big questions ahead, I think, as the treaty faces opposition domestically from groups that worry about impact on gun owners and, and gun manufacturers in the U.S., um, reaching the global quorum uh, and understanding really in practical terms how this treaty uh, alone can impact uh, the situation in Africa and what else might be needed to, to, to have it, uh, to be able to reduce the, the toll of, of small arms within Africa. Um, so lots of questions ahead, um, reaching that global quorum, getting a better understanding for African perspectives on the treaty. Only two to date have ratified, even though this, uh, there was a great deal of rhetorical support early on from African states. Uh, and the African Union and regional organizations have not shown a particularly energetic role in, in, in moving this forward on the continent. So today, to give us a much better understanding of these questions and the broader context uh, in which they sit, we're delighted to have with us Thomas Countryman, Assistant Secretary of State with the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation, and Dr. Raymond Gilpin, who's Academic Dean with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies part of the National Defense University. He's been a great friend and extremely thoughtful and rigorous analyst of African security challenges. Um, you have their short bios, so I'm not going to go into detail, but um, really it's a great pleasure to host you both here today, and we're looking forward to your remarks on this. I think we're going to begin with um, Assistant Secretary Countryman, uh, and then we'll turn to Raymond and leave plenty of uh, time for question and answer. This event is being webcast, so we welcome our web viewers as well. But when we do get into the Q&A, if you could wait for the mic and uh, identify yourself before speaking. So thanks very much, and uh, since Secretary Countryman, welcome. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction and for uh, setting clearly and briefly the kinds of topics that I hope we can discuss today. I have some definite views on some of these topics, but I also have a great readiness to listen to other views about what we can do. Um, as you know, at the end of the Cold War, the stage had seemed set for Africa to emerge from decades of conflict and really realize its potential as a stable, prosperous continent. Uh, sadly, in the last 20 years, of course, we've seen civil conflict 
in many parts of Africa, not only genocides in Rwanda and Darfur, but regional and sub-regional conflicts, uh, an upswing in terrorism, and even in some cases, the effective collapse of central governments in some African states. Uh, many leaders in Africa are working hard on regional solutions to these problems, but they also look to the outside world for assistance. And the outside world, of course, has an obligation to help African states find solutions to these regional conflicts. As part of that solution, many African states early on recognized the potential of a arms trade treaty to assist them in their efforts to contain and reduce the level of violence in civil conflicts. And as a consequence, African states were among those who led the political push to conclude a treaty at the United Nations. The argument rested in part on a belief that a significant proportion of the problems of the, that is the civil conflict problem in their countries could be attributed to the illegal import and trafficking of small arms and light weapons throughout Africa from sources outside Africa. And the treaty seemed to offer a way to help address the question of the flow of weapons originating from outside of the region. Now, after many years of hard work by countries from every region, but crucially including African states at the United Nations, and crucially including non-governmental organizations that pushed for the treaty, we were able to conclude a meaningful arms trade treaty. Moving forward, there is still more hard work to do, both by states around the world and by NGOs. We have to work hard, maybe even harder, than we did in the negotiations in order to ensure that states that have signed and ratified the treaty effectively implement their new obligations. And that's really what I want to talk about today is getting beyond the negotiation, getting beyond signing ceremonies, ratification steps in Parliament to talk about the steps countries can now take to make the goals of the arms trade treaty a reality. And in particular, what can African states, as one of the principal political impulses behind this treaty, do within the treaty and outside of the treaty to realize our common goals? When Secretary Kerry signed the Arms Trade Treaty in September, he explained what the treaty is about and, what it is, and why it is important. He said it's about keeping weapons out of the hands of terrorists and rogue actors, about reducing the risk of illegal international transfers of conventional arms that will be used to carry out crimes. It was about keeping Americans safe and keeping Americans strong and doing the same for other countries in the world. It was about peace and global security and about the advancement of humanitarian goals. He also spelled out clearly what this treaty is not. It's not about taking away domestic freedoms. President Obama has restated his strong belief in an individual's constitutional rights within the United States, and this treaty is fully consistent with the United States constitutional rights. The treaty recognizes the freedom of individuals and states to obtain, possess, and use arms for legitimate purposes. And crucially, it reaffirms the sovereign right of each country to decide for itself, consistent with its own constitution and laws, how to deal with conventional arms exclusively within its own borders. And there's one other thing that this treaty is not. It's not about limiting a country's sovereign rights to conduct responsible arms transfers. The Arms Trade Treaty is a trade regulation treaty focused exclusively on international trade and conventional arms. It seeks to create a global framework for responsible regulations by each state of transfer of arms. And the treaty recognizes that such transfer is a legitimate commercial activity that supports the national security and commercial interests of countries. So to discuss the ATT after negotiation, I would say that in order to achieve 
the noble ideals of the ATT, promoting global peace, advancing humanitarian objectives, it's not enough to sign or even not enough to ratify the treaty. The state's parties will have to ensure that the rule of law and good governance are enhanced, that each state's citizens can live in a stable and secure environment, and that each government achieves adequate control over international transfers and over national stockpiles of weapons. So in this context, there's a number of state, the steps that states can take to help achieve these ideals. Some of the actions I described today go beyond the specific obligations of the treaty, but are no less essential to meeting its purpose. I mention these today because it's important for all states to recognize that the ATT is not a solution in itself. It is instead a tool that can be used to address the larger challenges that gave rise to the treaty. We recognize, of course, as Jennifer mentioned in the introduction, that there is a significant problem with illegal transfers of small arms and light weapons into Africa, particularly in the 1990s, which have helped to fuel and sustain conflicts throughout the continent. And many of these illicit weapons, even those imported decades ago, are still in circulation today. And certainly, most weapons in Africa have come from outside the continent. There are few manufacturing capabilities within Africa. Not zero, but few. But the illicit flow of weapons from outside of Africa is only one aspect of the problem. A 2013 report by the UN Office on Drugs and Crimes, writing about organized crime in West Africa, said there are essentially five sources of illicit firearms in West Africa. First, legacy weapons from past conflicts in the region. Second, weapons from recent conflicts in neighboring regions. Third, weapons sold by or rented from corrupt security officials, military and police within the country. Fourth, weapons purposely transferred by neighboring governments. And fifth, and probably the smallest, a relatively small number of weapons imported from outside Africa specific to those conflicts. There has to be a means to address all the sources of weapons circulating in Africa. And it's a tall order. But it's important to recognize that the arms trade treaty in itself, no matter how effectively implemented, is not in itself enough to stem all these sources of weapons. So let's talk about some of the steps that I believe still need to be taken, by, both by governments within Africa and governments outside of Africa. We have to recognize that the international community must work together on a set of interrelated problems. The United States and other international actors, particularly the European Union, are prepared to help countries that are determined to deal with exactly these issues. It's very much part of our legacy, and I note part of the mission of the Bureau that I have the honor to lead. Let's start with an action that is required by the treaty itself. First, Countries have to establish and implement effective export control policies, effective export regimes for conventional weapons. Uh, most of many developed countries already have such regimes, but it's important that those all countries that are major exporters of weapons develop such export controls. But it is equally important and required by the treaty that every state develop import control regimes as well, so that weapons entering any state are adequately controlled by the government so that the government can take all appropriate measures to prevent their unlawful diversion. Most of our discussion in New York in two long rounds of negotiating this treaty was about the export 
controls. But it is crucial to emphasize that without effective import regimes as well, African states will not be able to reap the full benefits of this treaty. Establishing these effective import regimes is particularly crucial in those states that are currently suffering from a drastic oversupply of weapons. These import regimes <clears throat> need to be as transparent as possible in order to help prevent diversion and build confidence among the population and among partners internationally that ATT implementation is effective. It's not enough to have the laws, to have an import and an export control regime. All states, including those that already have these laws, need to continuously improve and implement effective border control and customs service, both in the written law and in the actual day-to-day -day practice. Effective border control and customs service go hand in hand with an effective arms trade treaty. Uh, here, again, the United States is extremely active in Africa and throughout the world in aiding countries in a cooperative basis to build more effective border control and custom services. My bureau alone puts about $60 million a year solely to this purpose, expanding export control and border security capabilities around the world. Even this is not enough. States must also be prepared to establish and implement and push forward an effective legal framework to prevent corruption. First, to be able to prosecute illegal arms traffickers within their borders. Secondly, to be able to cooperate with other states in attacking illegal arms traffickers outside of their borders. And the Arms Trade Treaty offers tools to do that in terms of encouraging member states, states' parties, to share evidence, to share legal procedures that, if used effectively, could put the black market dealers out of business. And third, states must be prepared to battle corruption within their own governments. Recall that one of the important sources of weapons that fuel regional conflicts in Africa are weapons that are stolen or frequently that are sold out of the arsenals of the military or the police within those states. Without a system of justice that effectively punishes those state uh, police or military officials who do that, we will not have prevented the continued supply of weapons and ammunitions. Now again, there's a lot that the United States can do working with African states, working with the European Union and others to assist in exactly these efforts. Not just in the kind of legal development that we do for example, through the Department of State's Bureau of International law, uh, Narcotics Control and Law Enforcement, but also in technical issues. Our Department of Justice, for example, can assist states in marketing, marking national weapons inventories and tracing illicit weapons. In Africa alone, we have assisted 24 states so far in marking the small arms that have been purchased for the military or the police. This is often neglected, but it's a very necessary first step if you're going to first manage your state inventory of weapons, the weapons that police and military need, and then be able to catalog and track those weapons if they are diverted from legitimate state stockpiles. Now, this is uh, the last main point on practical steps that can be taken. It's essential that countries in Africa, as well as elsewhere, but focusing today on Africa, institute and maintain effective controls over state-owned stockpiles of conventional weapons. Frequently, these arms are not well secured 
in police barracks or in military bases. Now, properly securing state-owned conventional arms is not an obligation created by the Arms Trade Treaty, which talks only about international transfers. But again, improvement in this area is essential if we are to realize the broader goals of the Arms Trade Treaty. And in fact, I want to give credit to several African delegations at the negotiations who focused on this issue and tried to ensure that the ATT included a reference to national stockpile security, although the final decision was that that was not exactly within the scope of the treaty. Again, stockpile security is an area where the United States offers substantial assistance to countries seeking it in two different ways and in several different programs. The State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs provides support to governments around the world to secure or, and destroy old or abandoned munitions and to enhance the national management of such stockpiles. Since 2001, when this program began, just in Africa, the United States has destroyed over 250,000 small weapons and marked 350,000 more with unique serial numbers. Uh, Department of State helps programs, has programs to enhance physical security at arms depots in places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Niger, Somalia. We've had such programs previously in Burundi, Switzerland, Angola. Uh, and it is not only the State Department, but also the Department of Defense that provides training assistance to help militaries in Africa and elsewhere manage more securely stockpiles of weapons and ammunitions. There's a key concept that motivates, I think, even though we didn't discuss it frequently in New York, uh, the value of the arms trade treaty, and that is transparency. As a trade regulation treaty, the arms trade treaty should have the same value of transparency that we expect when we're talking about international trade in energy or agriculture or high technology goods. And the arms trade treaty builds into it the means for countries to cooperate more closely on such transparency. But transparency also has to be a light that shines upon one of the key sources of weapons that fuel conflicts in Africa. And that is the frequently the conscious decision by African governments to supply weapons to allies who are fighting civil conflicts in a neighboring country. Without an honest conversation about that aspect of the supply of weapons in African civil conflicts, we can address only some aspects of the problem. There does need to be a recognition by African states that this has to be put openly on the table, that the source of weapons is not just illicit, drug, uh, illicit arms dealers 5,000 miles away, Sometimes it is another African government just across the border. Now, we are looking forward to the entry into force of the ATT. We think that it makes a beginning in addressing the kinds of problems that African states are justifiably concerned about and that it creates obligations on the rest of the world to do their part to prevent a destabilizing influx of conventional weapons into Africa. And we will do our part. I think here I can speak not only for the United States, but for the European Union and a number of other states who take this treaty seriously. In fact, who take it seriously because we've already incorporated virtually all of its requirements into our law. But we're prepared to do more than what is in the treaty. We're prepared to work cooperatively to put money and expertise 
and a genuine spirit of cooperation with partners throughout Africa into an effort not just to implement the ATT, but to realize its fundamental promise, that of a more secure and prosperous world, particularly in Africa. So thank you, and I look forward to a discussion. Thank you, Mr. Countryman. Raymond, welcome to Dr. Gilpin. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, and thanks to CSIS um, for inviting us to um, participate in what I think is a very important um, meeting. Um, the discussion is relevant not just because of what the treaty does or does not state, or what it does or does not imply for Africa's security. I think it's important because, because it is germane to the continent's long-term stability. Um, the flow of small arms and light weapons, um, the illegal trade and trafficking of these small arms and light weapons have uh, blighted not just the lives and livelihoods of millions, but also the fortunes of so many um, potentially prosperous countries across the African continent. And this is why um, we are pleased to be part of this discussion. Uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is um, the Department of Defense's uh, premier institution for strategic security studies on the African continent. Uh, between 2005 and 2009, the Africa Center conducted a series of regional workshops in Africa on small arms and light weapons. So a lot of what I'll be saying here today is going to be informed um, by the findings and conclusions of uh, more than 200 experts, uh, most of them African, who participated in this series between 2005 and 2009. Um, as um, the Assistant Secretary has rightly pointed out, the um, ATT is an important first step. It is by no means a silver bullet. Um, what I want to do very briefly is not go over the ground he has already covered, but I'll talk a little bit about my views on what this means for peace and security across the African continent. And then I'll share some of the challenges I believe that need to be overcome in Africa to ensure that when this treaty is ratified and implemented, it become, it, 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 um, it um, attains its desired effect. And then, like all good Beltway folk, I have a group of um, recommendations for you. Uh, my wish list, if the world were um, level and um, everything was equitable. But let me start by, by talking a little bit about some of the implications um, of this treaty uh, for Africa. I think that, um, for me, one of the most important things is that it introduces a modicum of responsibility in the trade and transfer of small arms and light weapons. As the Assistant Secretary pointed out, it shines a light where there has always been a lot of opaqueness, and it brings to the fore the importance of a collaborative effort between not just the signatories to the um, uh, treaty, but the industry um, as a whole to ensure that there is responsibility in trade of, of small arms and light weapons. Secondly, it also makes it a lot easier to enforce accountability. And I'll talk a little bit about this when, we talk, when, when, when I discuss some of, some of the challenges. Hopefully, it could help reduce the um, proliferation of small arms and light weapons. We've talked a bit about some of the sources. Um, this is an $8.5 billion um, industry. Um, there are a lot of equities there, and so being able, to, um, being, being, being able to unravel all the tentacles of the small arms and light weapons um, transactions, actors, and channels is going to require concerted effort and also um, collaboration among a, a larger group of, um, of um, stakeholders. Um, 
the treaty itself is not going to bring um, peace and security. It's not going to bring about peace and security across the continent for a number of reasons, and I'll highlight two. And the first is that conflict, violent conflict across the continent is a very complex and at times historically rooted phenomenon. It's not just a matter of the availability of small arms and light weapons. Um, we are currently doing some work on water and security, and researchers are, are tracing the um, effective um, uh, decimation of Lake Chad, and the, it's the impact of climate change, decimation of Lake Chad, Lake Chad on the political economy of the Sahel and why certain groups move in certain directions, and, wh and which is why we have um, people like, um, uh, partly why we have people like um, Boko Haram, and some of the instability in the Sahel. So it's historical, it is linked, and so it's not just um, an issue of if we were able to get rid of the small arms and light weapons, we'll have peace and security. We've also learned um, the uh, painful history in recent decades that machetes could be as deadly, even more deadly, than small arms and light weapons. And so um, we don't want to start this discussion from a position of delusion. Um, so the ADT is not going in itself to bring about um, the sort of um, peace and security. It is part of a larger puzzle. Um, we've um, also heard that um, while African countries were at the forefront of lobbying for this particular um, a treaty and being very involved in its deliberation, et cetera, et cetera, um, only two have ratified to date. And um, fewer have even given serious thought about, you know, how it's going to become law and how it's going to be implemented. But there are a number of um, practical issues I would like to um, raise. I'll go through five or six very quickly. And the first is, in most and I would say probably all African countries, um, we don't have a baseline of capacity and capability as far as um, small arms and light weapons, marking, tracking, registering, and, um, and any form of detailing. We don't have a baseline. And uh, this particular treaty is contingent upon the, abil uh, upon the ability of a state to do, to do those things. So you ask the obvious question, what's the starting point? And uh, how are we going to get African countries prepared to implement this treaty, even if it does go through um, national rat ratification, et cetera? The second challenge I believe that needs to be overcome is one that to which the assistant secretary alluded is the complicity of state actors not just in the transfer of um, small arms and white weapons, but also on the demand side and the use of proxy groups. We've seen this in the Great Lakes region. We've seen this in the Sudan. We've seen this in the Manu River Union. Um, so if the entities that are by international statute charged with um, ensuring the responsible export and import of these small arms and light weapons are themselves complicit, you would also again ask the obvious question, where is the impetus going to come from to, to bring this about? Because as we, we all know and all good um, observers of um, politics and security in Africa know that the state is a critical part of the um, of the conflict dynamic, the violent, violent conflict, conflict dynamic. And so how do you deal with the state as a player and a factor? The third thing that needs to be addressed is the um, complexity of what I call conflict-affected country political economies. Because once in countries across the African continent that have been affected by conflict. You see, not just, uh, you, you see not just a destruction of lives and property, but you see a selective destruction of lives and property. There are groups and strata in society who wield not just uh, military and political power, but also economic power. Why is this important? It's important because throughout the conflict and immediately after, the war economy determines not just which um, 
illicit commodities, like small arms and light weapons, enter or leave the country, but they also determine fuel, food, other commodities. It is the same actors, the same chains, the same financing um, channels. And so you really do have to disentangle the illicit part within the context of a political economy for you to make much um, progress. Because just trying to um, address the small arms and light weapons trade would mean that this is the same person who brings in food, rice. How do you address that? And these are the reasons why you see a lot of dragging of feet, because the practicalities are a lot more challenging. Um, fourth is the issue of capacity constraints in terms of human resources, technology, skills, financing that's needed to ensure that um, the treaty, that the trade or transfer of these small arms, um, small arms and light weapons could be monitored in a way that's consistent with the provisions of the ATT. Um, there are a number of um, um, regional and international both uh, bilateral and multilateral institutions that, are, that stand ready to help African countries. Um, but we really do need to do a better job of coordinating these efforts so that we don't have gaps or, um, dupli or, or, or duplicative, I was about to say duplicitous, or, du or duplicative efforts that are wasteful. Because, as we all know, this issue is one that is um, central to uh, the fortunes and stability of uh, millions across the continent. The fifth reason is that of um, undocumented domestic stockpiles and production. Um, the Assistant Secretary has mentioned those, but, um, you know, depending on who you talk to, these um, stockpiles are either more or less of a problem. And these stockpiles don't go through border <laughs> checkpoints and customs. They are the, they are the um, commodities that get smuggled and trafficked um, over, you know, borders and um, ungoverned spaces. Ungo ungoverned spaces, and they and they're also the channels that um, state actors use uh, to supply their proxies. The sixth challenge is the um, opaqueness in exporting countries. I know, yes, we are focusing on African countries on, and we need um, import, um, import, the capacity, import capacity as well, but um, you look at the uh, small arms survey um, transparency barometer and you would see that uh, there is no exporting country that um, passes master across the board. There are varying levels of opaqueness. And this, d this does make it difficult. It makes it difficult and challenging. Um, August 2013, um, a, a research entity group, um, stands for the Group for Research and Information on Peace and Security, published a report on uh, national reporting of small arms and light weapons in Africa. Let me just share with you a few of their, um, of their conclusions. They um, surveyed all African countries. They found out that um, most of the countries, about over 60%, do not have reporting legislation. They don't have laws that require, what require reporting. Most of them, about half, do not require marking or have any, have any um, arrangements for registration. Half of them ha claim to have tracing procedures in place but implementation is very weak across the board. Of all the countries surveyed, 43 have arrangements to track imports, 33 have legislation for exports, and only 24 have any legislation that covers transshipment. And at the heart of the ATT, in M Article 6 and 7, there are requirements for exports, imports, imports, and um, 
transshipment. So there's an urgent need to address these legislative gaps to ensure that, the, that African countries and African governments could be um, better positioned, not just to implement the um, ATT, but to address this um, important part of their security conundrum. What are my recommendations? I think firstly, we should focus on building the baseline in every country and uh, supporting capacity um, enhancements, not just human capacity, but also institutional. Secondly, I think that we need a public-private partnership to help clean up the supply chain. I know this sounds a little far-fetched, but a few years ago when we were discussing this as it relates to uh, conflict minerals, um, a lot of people said, oh no, the companies would not, um, would not want to have anything to do with this. But the companies very quickly see that it is in their best interest, and it's also more efficient to have a clean and transparent um, supply chain. So as we did with um, conflict minerals, I think we should get the industry involved and have a uh, public-private partnership to help um, shed some light to what goes on. Thirdly, I think that we require muscular international diplomacy to deal with countries that we know aid, abet, and sustain um, small arms light weapons trafficking and also um, utilize, uh, not only um, intervene um, directly on their, their own behalf, but utilize um, proxy groups in neighboring countries. Fourthly, it's important to disentangle illicit arms from legitimate trade because um, a lot that happens in the non-formal sector is not well understood by policy analysts. We usually go into a sledgehammer and we're gonna get rid of everything that is illicit. There are some things that are illicit, like trafficking, like um, cross-border movements of um, consumer goods, et cetera, that that's the only way that they could move because there are no institutions that far away from the um, capitals to facilitate trade. Uh, we have to be careful as we address the ATT issue that we do not um, upset the apple cart and um, do more harm than good. Fifthly, I think we need um, coordinated action to um, go after globalized networks that facilitate um, small arms and light weapons transfers, um, illicit transfers, and the associated impunity. Yeah, I know we um, got Victor Boot, but he's just one. There's many, many, many more and many more that we do know. And I think we, 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 if, if we are serious about having a treaty that's going to have teeth and a lasting impact across the continent, we should um, be able to um, garner support for concerted action. Uh, in closing, as the um, Assistant Secretary mentioned, there are a number of things outside the um, remit of the ATT that African countries need to be doing and need to be considering now to make an effort. Uh, my worry is that a number of countries will be waiting for ratification before they start thinking about acting. And I think if I have um, a concluding thought is that the small arms and light weapons challenge that continues to blight these countries is not about the ATT, it's about domestic security, it's about regional security, and it's about prospects for all African citizens. So now is a time that a lot of these things that I have um, listed and that the um, Assistant Secretary articulated should be tackled by African governments, civil society in African countries, um, the small arms life weapons industry, and all stakeholders. Thank you. Thanks very much to both of you um, for really, um, really thoughtful presentations that get to some of the challenges well outside the treaty. Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask a first question, and then we open up for a question and answer. First, to Assistant Secretary Countryman, I wonder, you know, this is a time when, you know, unfortunately, we've seen kind of a proliferation and unraveling in a lot of fragile states. It's a time when African countries have 
pledged to step up to their responsibilities in terms of regional security. Um, the U.S. looking for uh, ways to, to help build capacity more engaged in that uh, than ever. Um, and I wonder how much this kind of agenda, the agenda that you laid out in terms of, you know, securing domestic stockpiles, import regulations, is a part of the conversation that we have with African states as we uh, engage them on security capacity building. Is it something that Ambassador Brigadier at the, at the African Union brings up? Is it, a, is it a regular part of our conversations that our embassies have with governments and so forth? No. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. That's an excellent question. And thank you, Dr. Gilpin, for uh, some great ideas that I've taken good note of. <laughs> the, um, uh, the answer is, so far, not enough. Uh, it is not sufficiently integrated into the kind of dialogue that we have bilaterally with countries across the African continent. We do have fairly intense cooperation in the non-proliferation field generally, and I should mention that the non-proliferation uh, portfolio of my bureau is not very, just conventional weapons, it's very much about nuclear, chemical, biological weapons as well. And so we have very intense non-proliferation programs in all these fields with several countries in Africa, particularly South Africa, where we have well-established programs of cooperation for many years. We have growing uh, export control and border security programs with a number of states in Africa. As I mentioned, not just my bureau, but others in state and in Defense Department have stockpile management, weapons abatement programs with a number of African countries. What we haven't done is in most of these bilateral dialogues about what we can do next, is to put these into the framework that I tried to lay out today and to build upon the interests of those states in the arms trade treaty to help motivate them to take extra efforts that have the most immediate payoff for reducing the availability of weapons, reducing the level of violence in their country. So it is what we need to do, uh, but we are not doing enough of it yet. Thank you. And, and Raymond, um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the African Union and the regional economic communities and uh, what kind of leadership role might they play? I, I, I imagine, um, let's say, a, a peer review or a standard set. I mean, the African Union can play a role in terms of setting norms and standards um, if perhaps some kind of peer review mechanism, and if not the AU, perhaps uh, an ECOWAS, which has seen, you know, with the, uh, the collapse of Mali and the infusion of arms from all over the place, but particularly Libya, mm -hmm. um, might they kind of be a champion of this in a way um, to at least begin the standard setting, uh, the peer review, and, and kind of a, 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 a maybe an index of, uh, and so forth. But, I'll turn to you and then we'll, we'll open up. No, thank you very much. Um, I think that's an, an excellent uh, idea um, because we have uh, over 50 countries with varying levels of capacity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of them do not even have the legislation in place to start. Very few have the capacity so beginning to address it at a sub-regional level uh, makes sense. And why it makes sense is because most of the sub-regions already have protocols they can build on, like the um, ECOWAS Convention, the ECAS Convention, the Nairobi Protocol, the SADAC Protocol. All, they all exist, and these are, um, the, 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 these are instruments that uh, they could use to actually start doing things like um, putting uh, the framework for marking and tracing in place, um, getting um, um, database, regional and national database um, of uh, military and non-military um, weapons um, in their areas of responsibility. Also coordinating technical assistance because one of the things that the um, ATT uh, makes clear is that where necessary technical assistance 
would be um, available. And coordinating that is usually the Achilles heel of a lot of um, good intentions on the continent. And being able to engage the, sub, the um, regional economic communities to do this, I think, is a great idea. The African Union, on the other hand, uh, um, has a great role to play. It's a, it's a, it's, should it choose to do so? And I think this is a, this is a great forum um, uh, that we have to encourage them to do, to, um, to do so, because. dovetail very uh, nicely with the African Union's vision of um, sub-regional peace and security, the, uh, the African peace and security architecture. And so the, you have the building, building blocks in place that what we need to do now is to breathe life into them. And I think that starting with the regional economic communities is a great idea because of the, the protocols that exist and it's a much more manageable um, challenge. Great. Thank you both. Let's uh, turn for uh, questions now. As I said, uh, please wait for the mic and identify yourself. We have the gentleman in the far back. And we'll... uh, Robert Charetta, international investor. Uh, I wasn't quite clear the last question, so maybe this is a little redundant, but I wonder um, if, if our, our special guest, um, Mr. Gilpin, can comment or, or try to estimate where most of these arms are coming from, what nation, and who, who is most benefiting from this in terms of bringing them in? I know that's a, you know, we got a lot of countries to cover there, but is there, are there a couple of nations that are predominant in this? Do you want to take a few at a time? Well, let's take a few so you can right, think about that. Think about the list. It will come right up front here, and then we'll move over here. Thank you. Uh, James Bridger, Delex Systems. Um, this is a sort of specific case example. With the spread of private maritime security companies to deal with Somali piracy and the so-called floating armories to facilitate storage and embarkation of weapons, um, there's been a lot of worry, particularly out of India, that these weapons now could easily spread into the hands of the hostile forces across the entire Indian Ocean. Is this something that you've heard a lot of concern coming from African governments? Is it also something that uh, there's been any talk at uh, international level of regulating this beyond sort of industry self-regulation as it stands. Thank you. Okay, and we'll come, yes, here up front. Rosemary. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflicts, resolution, and violence prevention. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary and Mr. and Dr. Raymond. Uh, I come from Kenya. Many times, uh, conflicts and uh, violence in Africa, women have been the victims, children victims, and all that happened in Africa is so annoying. Despite the support from USA, uh, European Union, and all over the world, I just want to thank President Obama for the initiative he's doing on partnership. The partnership is the most important thing. The U.S. Department cannot do it alone. The global world cannot. You need to include us as civil society. And of all the people, women, who are the victims, this thing has been said on and on as you support. There is something that is missing. Civil partnership, private and public partnership, where companies that deal with security. Security is the most important thing in Africa. We need security. We are private. Our company can do security. We are a non-profit and a profit. This is needed in Africa. That partnership of private, public, civil society, and young people who are always the victims and actors, they need to be involved in from the grassroots up to the upper level. Otherwise, if you say only the head of state, the government, it's not going to work. Let us partner and work on this as collective and in partnership and I think this can can make a difference so how do we do this how do we partner from here as a global diaspora Kenyan diaspora African diaspora and a woman concerned of other women children who are normally the victims of thank violence you. and conflicts thank you thanks um, sh should we take just one more that was more in the way of a con uh, and the, maybe a con Thank you. Um, Rachel Stoll from Stimson. I, I had a question, which I will ask, but I do want to make a comment because Dr. Gilpin mentioned the necessity for having a baseline of, of capacity, and there is a project that is ongoing 
um, which is called the Baseline Assessment Survey Project, which is doing uh, just that, which is a survey of all UN member states to identify uh, article by article uh, within the ATT where states are today so that when the treaty enters into force, we can actually measure if the, if the treaty's um, having an impact. So there is a, a process there, and one of the challenges is getting the right people to, to fill out those surveys, and particularly in Africa, what we're finding is that the systems are either very small arms focused and not the larger conventional arms issue. So my initial question to you is how do we engage the right people in capitals um, to fill out these surveys to be part of the kind of effective implementation and identify those partners, but also for Assistant Secretary Countryman, kind of what's next for the U.S.? The U.S. has signed. It seems very obvious and clear that there will be 50 signatures um, by the one-year anniversary of the adoption of the ATT, which means the Conference of States Parties is coming. Where does the U.S. fit in on all of that? Great. That's a good uh, set of questions there. Um, I think they're all for you. you <laughs> <laughs> You're wel welcome to chime in on the first one, which is kind of naming names. Uh, if you wish. But um, should we start with you, Raymond, and then move to assistance? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, really um, great questions. Um, the the uh, Small Arms Survey annual report um, lists the main exporters and importers of um, small arms and light weapons um, annually. It also lists um, the key uh, transshipment um, countries. I mention this because of the second part of your question, which is who, who is benefiting. Um, it's a rather convoluted supply chain um, for the, uh, in the small arms business, which includes not just um, hard currency, but commodity swaps at times along the way. So um, being able to say exactly who is benefiting and how much at any point in time um, requires a bit of um, research. Uh, I wish I can do, I'd, I'd be very interested in that, but I haven't seen it done as yet. Um, the main um, exporters are your um, usual suspects, um, Western countries, um, Russia, China, etc. But the people who actually traffic it along the chain until it gets to the militia or it gets to the government, um, that's a shadowy world that, um, you know, we need to take down an, another Victor Booth to find out, you know, what another looks like. But what I could say is that um, uh, there's a lot of people benefiting from it. Um, it's 8.5 billion in small arms sales, but the um, degree of beneficiation along the chain I think increases that uh, amount exponentially when you think about service, um, service payments, et cetera. I think it's, uh, there's a lot of people who have significant equity. And, so the import and that's why I think it's important for industry to also be part of this because it makes it easier for industry to be efficient if we have a predictable and open supply chain. Um, the second question about um, MSS and private security um, firms, um, you know, that has been, that, that, you know, even before the, um, the assets were deployed, there was a significant discussion about what does this mean in terms of proliferation. Um, um, we have, and we have, we, the Africa Center, have conducted a number of maritime safety and security um, seminars in West Africa, Horn of Africa. The issue does come up, but um, people are a lot more worried about what's going to happen to the assets that are bequeathed to national governments rather than those um, um, held by the PMCs. Because the PMs, the, sorry, the private military um, companies have a more rigorous accountability um, arrangement than do the governments. And so that's we worry a lot more about what the governments who have received um, small arms and light weapons, or the pirates and the equipment, what they, how that's going to be utilized. Um, take the Niger Delta, for instance, um, a lot more than the um, PMCs. Not to say the PMCs are not worrisome, but relatively speaking, it's um, uh, you know what the governments have um, been doing. Um, Rachel. Um, 
I was, you know, I was in a rush. I should have, I, I would, should have, would have mentioned uh, the Stimson Initiative. Um, it is, it is, it's, it is ongoing. I think that we, we really do need um, to have one that focuses a lot more on the continent, because um, if you look at the starting, compare the starting point of the average African country in this regard with um, you know any other develop, developing part of the world, the last four decades in Africa have seen um, state involvement in uh, violent conflict to an extent that even there's no way to tell who has what in terms of small arms and light weapons. Um, uh, so we need we need a lot more focus on on uh, on African countries. And I think that there are two. If if I were to give two um, tips in terms of um, how do you get them to um, fill out the forms, um, the first has to be they need to be able to see their self-interest in this. They need to understand, and that's where the um, ladies talk, the, the, the ladies' intervention about the importance of getting civil society involved, sensitizing the groups. People have to recognize that this is not just an internal security challenge, it's a national security challenge and with that everybody has to be involved with. So once it, once it becomes part of election campaigns, it's a lot easier for them to do it. And the second is persistence. Um, it's not going to be easy, um, but you, you have to be persistent. The GRIP report, which I'm sure you've, you, 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 you have seen, um, utilize a lot of um, in-country, I think they visited 11 countries, right? Um, this is, they utilize a lot, a lot of um, in-country groups that made it easier for some of the, for some of this um, quote-unquote sensitive information to be divulged. But those are the two things that, that I would say. Okay, let me try these same four questions, but in different order. And uh, First, a question about private security companies that are protecting against piracy. Uh, I have not heard before today anyone express a concern about relatively small number of weapons that are used to secure ships as they go through uh, around the Horn of Africa. I've not heard any countries express a concern about that diversion. I'm not saying it's impossible, but haven't heard it. Question, where do the arms come from? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you a straight answer for two reasons. Uh, one is I'm not a sufficient expert uh, to go on the record as being quoted as U.S. government accuses this country and this country and this guy. <laughs> I'm just not going to do that. Uh, but I will say that uh, there are so many different patterns that you can't make a generalization about Africa on this issue as indeed on many other issues. Uh, a pattern in Somalia, which involved uh, guns originating from Eastern Europe going through Yemen and the traditional Yemen-Somali connection, is one pattern. Uh, the kind of pattern of blood minerals or gems in certain places in West Africa drew a substantially different pattern of money acquisition, money outflow, weapons inflow. And then there are conflicts such as those in the Great Lakes where clearly a major source of uh, guns for contending forces are directly from neighboring governments. Uh, these are very different patterns and they need to be analyzed one by one and I think uh, an academic or a non-governmental organization could give you a better answer than a U.S. government official on any of these things. Uh, Rosemary, appreciate the words on civil society. Uh, I sometimes think about if I were from Kenya or from Namibia or from Ghana, which civil society group would I like to be in? Because there are so many issues of good government, of reform, uh, of equality that have to be dealt with in any of those countries. I expect that lobbying for better laws about import of weapons is probably not the most popular NGO in any African country today. Uh, but it is still essential 
for civil society to help governments make the right decisions. It was civil society that motivated a lot of governments, educating them uh, about the treaty and the realities of arms trade that led to the political impetus for this treaty at the United Nations. It was NGOs in this country that did the same and reached 50% of the population. Uh, it is, I think, essential in Africa as well and important for NGOs from other countries to assist sisters and brothers in Africa in helping to build that kind of constituency, not necessarily in a dedicated NGO, uh, but uh, in getting the kind of support from civil society that will help governments recognize their own responsibility for dealing with these issues. Uh, what's next for the United States? Well, lots of things. First, uh, I don't know uh, when it will be feasible to submit the arms trade treaty or any other treaty for ratification to the Senate. Uh, the, uh, I think there needs to be a focus on beginning an actual discussion. To date, there has not been a discussion. Uh, there are groups that opposed the arms trade treaty before the first word was negotiated, uh, and no version of a treaty would ever have won anything except their stern opposition. They have significant support in the U.S. Senate. That's a reality. There's nothing sinister about it. Uh, that is simply the political reality. The different political reality today from just to betray my age from the kind of United States I grew up with, is there was a time when people who disagreed would discuss things with each other. Doesn't happen anymore. Uh, our attempts to speak uh, to senators about the realities of the treaty, it's tough to get an audience. Again, they're very busy. I don't blame them. Those organizations that are vehemently opposed are simply afraid to discuss this other than in front of an audience that they have handpicked. So I don't know if we'll ever get an actual discussion of the kind that your democracy textbooks talk about. Uh, I think we'll get the kind of debate that reflects the kind of debate we have on most issues today. Uh, despite that discouraging prognosis, uh, we'll continue to speak frankly and seek uh, to talk honestly with anybody who's got an open mind. Um, and just one word on the civil society component. A big element would be is an investigative uh, media capacity, which, you know, in South Africa and other places have done uh, a great deal on breaking some of the big arms trade scandals and so forth. Just a thought. Um, Jennifer and then Connie. And Well, thank you very much to the panel. I'm Jennifer Mackby, C connected to CSIS. So I was wondering if you could explain, I understand why the U.S. is not going to ratify soon anyway, but what about the other countries? You said only two had ratified, so I wondered if you could explain why not more, and how many have signed the treaty? Thank you. Two in Africa, right, yeah. Um, and then uh, Connie, here. Thank you, Connie Freeman. I'm with Syracuse University. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation and feel like I learned quite a lot today. I was intrigued, Dr. Gilpin, with your mentioning uh, public-private partnerships to work on this issue uh, because I think that many governments have a self-interest in not working on it uh, and that we need to find some other channels for it. And you mentioned that with conflict minerals, companies in the private sector had been more amenable than some people had anticipated. And I'm just wondering if you can expand on that a little bit. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My, my name is Allison Pitlack and I'm with the Control Arms Coalition. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, without preempting any response from the panel, uh, get back to the question of the only two ratifications among African countries. My coalition's following the ratification process very closely. 
Uh, it's only been about 10 months since the treaties opened for signature, so it's pretty astonishing that 31 governments have already managed to ratify in that time, and that we might even see 50 uh, before we reach a year. Um, I know that many African governments are working hard uh, to get the ratification process accomplished. But as uh, was mentioned earlier, there are a lot of legislative gaps that are preventing this from moving as quickly as we would like, and we want it to be done in as proper a manner as possible. Great. Um, thank you for that. Great. Excellent point. And then we'll go to the gentleman here and come back to the panel. Hi, I'm Gary Sargent, Treadstone Light. Um, I'm a retired Army Special Forces guy, spent some time in Africa in the 90s. Um, my question really is, is mill to mill, and it's more of a comment, if I could get a comment since I got the NDU dean, one of the deans here, um, comment on the mill to mill interface between our country and most of the African countries. Is that a helpful piece, not helpful, and do you see an increase in that now that we're extracting ourselves out of the Mideast. Uh, would you like to s take the first? Um, uh, I'm not sure I have much to say. I appreciate the information about uh, yeah. uh, the number of African states that are signed and ratified. It, it's about, equi it's nearly equivalent to their proportion of the total number of states in the world. Uh, and I've given up trying to explain our ratification process to anyone else, so I'm not going to try to explain <laughs> other people's or why it's slow. Um, the, uh, uh, I agree with the comments about press, investigative media. Uh, it's what I mean when I say there needs to be transparency, or Dr. Gilpin means when he says there needs to be less opacity in uh, international transactions. Mill to mill, Connections again. It it, it is uh, you pretty much have to go country by country. There are countries uh, with whom the United States has a long military relationship. Uh, countries in Africa that have effective civilian control of government and, as a consequence, are building truly professional militaries. And then there are gradations below that. Uh, and our relationship varies with each and is crucially dependent upon the level of civilian versus military control in those governments. Uh, but in general, uh, those states with whom we are able to sustain uh, a strong relationship uh, between mili from military to military over the years have, I think, obtained some of the benefits uh, of what we can offer in terms of professionalization of the military, including stockpile management, fighting corruption, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's my only comment on a good point. Yeah, thank you. Um, not much to add on that, just to um, probably try to um, get at the second part of your question which was, um, do we anticipate an increase in African mill-to-mill -mill as we draw down elsewhere? Um, I think that's in the realm of um, hope. Um, uh, we hope that there is, um, because as you know, that um, we um, have a strategic pivot towards um, the um, east. And so I think a lot of the um, slack, so to speak, might look east, but we're hoping that a significant proportion of it um, comes Africa's way. Um, uh, on the um, public-private um, partnerships, um, it was a really, really, really long road because there were a number of different types of um, companies that were involved, um, the electronics, uh, manufacturing, etc. And um, uh, people thought that because of the complexity of the supply chain it would be difficult. Uh, it has been difficult, but because the, com the companies have worked together, we now have Intel, for instance, announcing that it could verify that it has a conflict-free supply chain for the specified minerals. We have Apple announcing that for its processors, it could also verify. Um, a number of other, co of, 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 of other companies are you know, not too far behind. And those are significant efforts because verifying um, the um, uh, supply chain for something like tungsten is 
costly, it's cumbersome, but they did it because, you know, all parties saw self-interest in uh, predictable, open, and um, transparent uh, transaction environment. And my hope is that since we know that the governments will be reluctant because they have um, equities in conflict in some instances, if we have the companies on board as well, it kind of um, you know, makes it less threatening to them. It's not so much of an existential us versus them. It is we're all in this together. And I think that the um, companies would be able to um, you know, uh, do what they did in the conflict mineral uh, issues I move forward regardless of what the governments are doing and make progress. So that's what I'm hoping we'll be able to do through a public-private partnership in this particular space. Hi there, I'm Annie Leonard. I'm an intern for an interested California-based lawyer. And I was wondering, um, the Arms Trade Treaty has been accused of ambiguity, and I was wondering if you guys believe the treaty is ambiguous and why you feel it was accepted in a form that's drawn such complaints. And also, I know you've mentioned a lack of uh, treaty-related discussion in the Senate, but I was wondering if you feel if it's in the best interest of the Senate to ratify a treaty that's been accused of ambiguity. Hi, John Doyle, uh, defense writer and uh, uh, editor of the 4G War blog. Uh, I wanted to ask about the role of organized crime possibly in arms trafficking. I, I, know, I know, or at least I've been told by ATF people that it's not a big issue yet in Africa, but given uh, the rise of uh, Africa being used by Latin American cartels as a transnational shipping point, whether the violence that we've seen south of the border is, is going to flow in that direction as well. and. Uh, what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. And finally. I'm, I'm Denzel. I'm from South Africa. Um, my question is related to that. It's like when the new government came in power there, there was over 2,000 caches there. I don't think they ever lifted them. And <clears throat> when, when they lift in the caches, that's all the weapon systems they use. <clears throat> and the, the weapon system runs with the drug system. And then there's no people with jobs. So you have to integrate all those systems. You can't just go, hey, what's the arms problem? Thank you. Sure. Um, just very, very quickly, um, I will not be able to, to, just, to do justice to the ambiguity um, question. Um, I think all treaties have, since they're full of legalese, they are by definition uh, slightly, um, the, the language is a little loose because you want to cover a multitude of sins. Um, but there are parts of the, um, parts of the um, treaty, particularly those that um, are requiring um, countries to assess, um, uh, you know, assess the um, efficacy of um, export or internal controls and as, as to their impact on undermining peace and security. That's very vague language because how could you assess that this grenade that's going from here to there is going to impact peace and security? There's many leaps of logic and faith before you get there. So it's loose language. It's also loose language in the sense of, you know, how you um, measure the impact of diversion. There's loose language in um, reporting and publishing, um, but it, reporting and publishing requirements. Um, I don't think that that detracts from the uh, strength of the treaty itself. I just uh, think that there are a number of um, areas that probably need to be fine-tuned as a country to ratify and implement domestically. But I think the treaty itself is sufficiently broad to allow a number of um, 
um, parliaments and uh, houses of uh, and legislative bodies, including ours, to find common ground. Um, the org organized crime issue is uh, becoming um, problematic across uh, the African continent. Um, we um, are seeing an increase in um, organized crime activity. We are seeing an increase in some countries of what I would call state capture, where organized crime groups actually control the politics. If you take a look at um, political, um, political, um, uh, political parties and elections in Africa, you would see parties that come out of nowhere all of a sudden flush with money. You would see candidates um, who had nothing two years ago all of a sudden having huge <coughs> billboards all over the place. Um, you know, you have to ask the, you, you have, you, you have to ask the um, obvious questions. And so not only in terms of um, the um, violent crime and violence and violent conflict, but also state capture, which itself becomes problematic because those regimes um, then themselves become party to um, not just violent and organized crime, but the perpetration of violence and also the facilitation of uh, the flow of not just narcotics, but small arms and light weapons. And the gentleman from South Africa, you're absolutely right. What we have here is a collectively reinforcing problem. You can't just take one. You really have to have a 35,000 foot view of the totality and see how you um, exercise the leverage that you do have to um, bring into effect first order, second order effects over time. Um, so you're absolutely right and I completely agree with you. Thanks, the last two questions are, are very good ones but I don't think I can add to what Dr. Gilpin has said. Uh, ambiguity, a uh, couple of points. First, I would never, never advise any politician or any attorney for that matter to say or do anything ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, we want to measure ambiguity against what? Against other treaties? against United States legislation, against the uh, uh, handbook of U.S. export regulations, which is how thick, help me out here, Meg, it's this big. Uh, it is not and is not intended to be legislation. On the points that matter and that should matter, I submit, to legislators in the United States, it is absolutely unambiguous. The responsibility for writing the laws and regulations to implement this treaty belong to national states, national legislators. We've, we're already implementing the treaty. There is not a single piece of legislation required for the United States to be able to say, we are now in compliance with the arms trade treaty. We're doing it. We lead the world in it. We did it first. We think it's a damn good thing for other states to do too. And we don't have to change any laws. On that point, the treaty is unambiguous. If we think it's a good thing for the United States to do, do we think it's a good thing for other countries to do? And so far the answer from those who don't like it or who make the ambiguity tr argument when it suits them is that we don't give a damn if other countries have standards. We don't care whether American industry competes on a more equal playing field we have no opinion as to whether other states ought to be held to the same standards and the same criticism as the United States. I'm happy to be shown a single point in this treaty 
where the ambiguity causes a problem for the United States. Will it cause an argument, a debate in another country when their legislature writes a law to, to implement the treaty? Probably. Ambiguity might be an issue there. But we already know what our policy is. The Congress said it 50 years ago and has fine-tuned it constantly since. There's no ambiguity in U.S. law and policy. And no amount of ambiguity in a treaty, which is by its very definition, like other treaties, ambiguous, can change the fact that the U.S. knows what it's doing. And I don't mean the U.S. administration, I mean the U.S. Congress that wrote the laws the administration enforces. Note to end on, and, and not much ambiguity in our Constitution on, on that either. So, um, <laughs> um, listen, I want to thank you both for, I, I certainly, like Connie, I th I've learned a lot in this, and I think that's always a, a signal of a really fruitful conversation for me at least. And um, I want to thank you, Assistant Secretary and Dr. Gilpin, for um, really being with us and, and uh, thrashing through these issues. Thank you all, too. Thank you. Thank you. That's